Okay, found it. Um, oh, section two, proposition 13 through 24, um, Spinoza lays out this position, uh, that the mind is the idea of the body. So to understand Spinoza's account of the mind, um, uh, we have to start with this pr um, the, 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 the proposition in section two, um, section two proposition seven, which is... Oh, Propositions as section two, proposition seven. See, this is uh, the problem with um, the layout. It, it refers back upon itself and that sort of thing. So, proposition seven: uh, the order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. Right. So, um, the idea here um, is um, it, it, together with its uh, scolium commits uh, him to the thesis that for each finite mode of, ex uh, of extension there exists a finite mode of thought that corresponds to it and from which it is not really distinct. All right. Um, it, 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 so this commits him to uh, the thesis that for each simple body uh, there exists a simple idea that corresponds to it and from which it's not really distinct and furthermore uh, for each composite body there exists a composite idea that corresponds to it and from which it's not really distinct composed um, of ideas cor corresponding to each of the bodies of which the composite body is composed. Right? It's uh, awkward, I know. Right? But um, where this gets us, um, it is uh, the position that he does not consider the human mind to be unique. It's simply the idea that corresponds to the human body. But in taking this position, Spinoza does not mean to imply that all minds are alike, um, as minds are expressions of the bodies to which they correspond. In uh, the dominant thought, some have abilities that others do not. So simply, the greater the capacity of a body for acting and being acted upon, the great, greater the capacity of the mind that corresponds um, to it for uh, perception. Um, and this uh, is from uh, Section 2, Proposition 13, uh, the Scolium. In proportion, uh, proportion as a body is more capable than others of doing many things at once or being acted on in many ways at once, so, it is my, um, so its mind is more capable than others of perceiving many things at once. And in uh, proportion, as the actions of a body depend more on itself alone, and as uh, other bodies concur with it less in acting, so it, uh, its mind is more capable of understanding distinctly. And from these truths, I add that, um, we know the excellence of uh, one mind over others. So this is the explanation of the excellence of the human mind. The human body uh, as a highly complex comp uh, composite of many simple bodies is able to act and be acted on in um, myriad ways that other bodies cannot. The human mind um, as an expression of that body in the domain of thought mirrors the body in being a highly complex uh, composite of many simple ideas and is thus possessed of um, uh, the, the, these capacities exceeding those of other non-human minds. Only a mind that corresponds to a body of complex, uh, complexity comparable to that of the human body can have perceptual ab abilities comparable to those of the human mind, right? So um, for Spinoza, there does not exist a real distinction between mind and body, right? Um, though they are to some extent distinct from one another, they are parallel, right, to one another and interdependent upon one another, right? So um, if you're looking to uh, flesh out these notions, um, like I say, propositions uh, 13 through 24 um, in section two do that nicely, right? Um, so, uh, 
What we've got just in terms of overview um, is an idea of God as a perfect being and that perfect being, that idea of God as married to substance, thus dis it, it, it sort of um, uh, dissolving the, the distinction between God and nature, God and substance. So we get God as nature. Um, through this, we get a model for the universe, and that model is uh, one in which right, the freedom of God acts imminently as necessity. So, um, for Spinoza, what we find is that uh, everything is just as causally determined as logic actually acts in terms of its sort of necessity as well. Right? So, um, uh, logical necessity and causal necessity are the same kind of necessity. Um, his moral psychology uh, tends to explain how we go into error, and um, human action is completely determined within um, these these it, 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 between uh, within this system. All right. So the problematics that I want to introduce to you here, um, the first is within the discussion forum, the problem of the free will. It's not really a problem for Schopenhauer because Scho or Schopenhauer, I keep on doing that um, in my mind. It's, it's Schopenhauer and um, Spinoza actually have some similarities to one another, um, though Schopenhauer is more Kantian and Spinoza is... Um, is sort of a, a horse of a different color. Uh, free will is not for Spinoza so much a problem as the delusion of free will actually presents itself as a result of our not understanding the causal forces that determine us, right? So our psychological states, um, our choices, and our actions are just as conditioned as any force of nature or any force of logical necessity. So f the free will is a delusion that, um, that, that, that Spinoza does not even want to apply to God because uh, applying the notion of a free will to God means that God can act this way or that way and choose otherwise than his nature. But since God is the necessity of its essence, right? there can be no such distinction. Right? Secondly, right, um, the relationship between mind and body. Right? Um, so I want you to think through this. Uh, couched in Descartes' distinction, uh, hard dualism, this uh, uh, opposition between mind and body. Right? Um, and I've got a note here to read Proposition 21 from Section 2, so I will do that. Look at that, I'm already on the page. This is your page um, 175. Uh, this idea of the mind is united to the mind in the same way as the mind is united to the body. Proof that the mind is united to the body, we have shown from the fact that the body is uh, the object of the mind. And so, by the same reasoning, the idea of the mind must be united to its object, that is, to the mind itself, in the same way as the mind is united to the body. Scully. Uh, this proposition is understood far more clearly from um, uh, the scolium attached to Proposition 7, uh, Section 2, uh, that I referred back to earlier. Um, there we showed that the idea of the body and uh, the body itself, that is, mind and body, are one and the same in uh, individual thing. Uh, conceived now under the attribute of um, the thought and uh, now under the attri attribute of extension. Right? Therefore, the idea of the mind and the mind itself are one and the same thing, conceived under one and the same attribute, namely thought. The idea of the mind, I repeat, and the, the mind itself follow in, uh, follow in God by the same necessity and from the same power of thought. For, in fact, uh, the idea of the mind that is the idea of an idea is nothing other than uh, the form of the idea insofar as the idea is considered as a mode of thinking 
without relation to its object. For as soon as anyone knows something, um, uh, by that very fact he knows that he knows, uh, whips of uh, St. Uh, Augustine here, and at the same time he knows uh, that he knows that he knows, and so on ad infinitum. But I will deal with this subject later. All right. So, mind and body are united. Right? Just like uh, the idea of mind is united to mind, uh, the idea of body is united to body. So the, the mind as the idea of the body are completely united. They're parallel. There's hardly a distinction to be made. Right? So um, it, that I find fascinating about Descartes. And um, I'll uh, ask you to offer an account of this. All right? Um, and then, ab absolutely fascinating and distinct from Descartes again, um, is uh, Spinoza's account of error. You remember in Descartes that um, a error, falsity, right, um, actually occurs as a result of the free will. Right? We have, yes, finite attributes in Descartes, but nonetheless, since they are created by God, they are perfect ones of what they are, our faculties of reason, imagination, and the will, right, are perfect expressions, though finite. Right? Um, so it's not our faculties of judgment or anything along those lines that uh, lead us into error in the Cartesian system, but rather it's a misapplication of these faculties and solely within the will do we find uh, the possibility of misapplying these particular faculties. Right? Now, since Spinoza, I almost called him Schopenhauer again, since Spinoza has it actually called freedom of the will one of the greatest delusions that human beings suffer from. Right? He cannot point to the will as the cause of error. Instead, he actually forges a distinction between inadequate ideas and adequate ideas. Right? So, um, starting with, and this is what puts Spinoza decisively in the rationalist camp, um, it, it, sense perception it not only yields um, the action of uh, uh, the action of an external body uh, uh, of an external upon the body but uh, the effect of that external body upon the sense organs as well the ideas stemming from these sense uh, uh, perceptions are inadequate in two respects you see he's not as simple as Descartes who points out that our sense perceptions can be deceptive and therefore since they're dubitable right uh, they do not have the potency of reason which is also thanks to the evil genius dubitable except redeemed through an idea of a god who's not a trickster right instead what Spinoza wants to do is show that sense perceptions as sense perceptions are necessarily inadequate right so um, the ideas stemming from sense perceptions are inadequate in two respects first off they're grounded in the mind's representation of the state of one's own body rather than in a direct representation of external bodies so when i see a thing what's actually having happening is that external thing that's out there is acting upon my sense organs right so in addition to a perception of a thing what i'm getting is the effect of that thing impinging itself on my sense organs right so to some extent interestingly Spinoza is in dialogue with the early sections of Hobbes Leviathan where he's actually discussing the, and, and other empiricists um, it, where they discuss right um, all of our ideas stemming from sense perceptions and sense perceptions uh, being caused by external objects impinging themselves upon our sense organs insofar as they are doing that what we get when we actually perceive a thing out in the world is not a pure or clean perception of that thing, but rather a, sort of an amalgam of that 
thing and its effect that it's having upon our sense organs. So we never really see a thing. To some extent, well, not to some extent, this is a very important notion that we will have to maintain as we move to Hume and Kant uh, following this section. Right? Secondly, right, uh, the ideas that are occasioned by the sense perception, and what's more, imagination as well, um, are, as he calls, as they're sometimes called, mutilated. I might call them that. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, all right. Um, what is it? One A four. All right. Um, the first act, uh, 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 section one, axiom four. Reads. Knows his ethics. Do, 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 do. Section one. Oh, come on. Here we go. So, um, your page one forty five. Um, uh, axiom four. Uh, the knowledge of an effect depends on and involves the knowledge of the cause. Right? So, um, in addition to the fact that the, the, the representations of the things of the world that we get through our sense perceptions also uh, come to us in, 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 as the, the, the first sort of inadequacy are it, come to us sort of sort of mutated by our impressions of our body as well. So when we see something different from us, we confuse that sense perception because we also get a sense of our own body getting the sense perception. Secondly, the ideas themselves are um, mutilated. So the knowledge of an effect depends on and involves the knowledge of the cause. A sense perception or imaginative ideas, on t for that matter, can never, never satisfy this condition. Right? The mind may contain the idea of an external body, but it cannot contain the ideas of all the causes of that body, these being infinite. Right? So, when I see a thing, I may actually see an effect, but I do not know the cause of that effect and the cause of the effects that produce that effect, and so on and so forth, ad infinitum. So, the mind's idea of the body, and this is an interesting con uh, consequence of this, uh, the mind's idea of the body, that is, one's own body, and the mind's idea of itself also fail in this respect. Right? So, uh, with regard to our course theme, right, we can never have an adequate idea of our own bodies, nor can we ever have an adequate idea of our own minds, our minds being that which is producing the idea of our own minds. Right. Now, his account of ad in, in, in inadequate ideas aside, right? Um, adequate ideas uh, it, it, it are actually still possible for Spinoza. Note that inadequate ideas are inadequate since they involve a distinction between uh, an external body acting and uh, uh, acting on one's own body, right? So there's an external body acting on my body, and that body external is distinct from my body, all right? Adequate ideas involve, uh, in, in, involve intellectual ideas of common things, that is, common to all bodies or common to uh, the, the human body and certain bodies by which the human body is regularly affected. Right? If, stay with me here. Right? So what Spinoza is claiming here is that if there is something common between that body that is impinging on my senses and my own body, I can reflect and actually form an adequate idea of that commonality, right? So any idea that flows from an adequate idea, right, those that stem from something that is common between the thing that I'm sensing and the thing doing the sensing, right? Um, any idea that flo of, uh, follows from an adequate idea is itself adequate and can serve as an axiom in a deductive system.
All right. So ultimately, what uh, Spinoza does is he lays out um, three sorts of idea. Uh, the first sort are inadequate perceptions divided into, um, which he divides into two parts. Right. One from random experience, and that's what we've just treated. Right. And two, uh, knowledge from science. Right, and we might consider words science. Right, so um, I say apple, you think apple, not because the word apple caused you to think of an apple, but rather because, right, not because there's any sort of necessary con connection between the word apple and the thing out there in the world, apple, but rather, um, it, it, anyhow. Uh, Spinoza says that these ideas, um, uh, insofar as they're inadequate, uh, la it both lack rational order. So it's either from random experience or knowledge from science. Both of these lack rational order. Second, all right, reason. And you might not be surprised by that, him being a rationalist. The formation of adequate ideas um, of, of, of the common properties of things and uh, the movement by way of deductive inference to the formation of adequate ideas of other common properties. That's what he means by reason, right? So um, I can form an adequate idea of something that is common between my body and the body that's acting upon my body to produce a sense impression. And then that way I can use reason to make inferences on the basis of that abstraction of what's common between those bodies, right? Um, motion, extension, that sort of thing, right? Um, so, right, these things become axioms or principles by which we can actually form adequate ideas and from those adequate ideas deductively form additional adequate ideas. Now, interestingly, um, you, you might think that that is all that you can get from Spinoza, but he adds and doesn't sufficiently explicate, but nonetheless adds a third sort of idea, intuitive knowledge. Right, and this on your page 181, right, he lays out, let's just go to the page 181, do, 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 do. where is it, this kind of knowledge, okay, so he lays this out on page 181, I'll just quickly read it here, okay, so this is in um, section 2, proposition 40, right, Apart from these two kinds of uh, kinds of knowledge, there is, as I shall later show, a third kind of knowledge which I shall refer to as intuition. This kind of knowledge proceeds from an adequate idea of the formal essence of certain attributes of God to the adequate knowledge of the essence of things. I shall illustrate all these kinds of knowledge by using one single example. The three numbers are given. It is required to find a fourth, uh, which is related to the third as <clears throat> the second to the first. A tradesman having no hesitation in multiplying the second by the third and dividing the product by the first, either because they have not yet forgotten the rule they learned. It, anyhow, it uses a mathematical example, and it, you might actually infer that mathematics is um, this kind of intuition. So, um, three kinds of adequate knowledge. Inadequate knowledge is always caused by um, the, the, the inadequate ideas that are formed by our sense perception. So Proposition 41, Section 2 asserts that knowledge of the first kind is the only cause of falsity, whereas knowledge of the second and third kind are necessarily true. So it's the bloody senses that lead us astray for Spinoza. Right. So for Spinoza, there's no free will, and as such, free will cannot be the cause of error, as we saw in Descartes. All right. Um, so, like I say, I've asked you to do something very, very difficult in reading through and trying to understand Spinoza here. I find it fascinating. I find it an interesting puzzle. Um, I find myself tripping through 
um, these 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 propositions and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of your reading and rereading of this material, I find um, I, I found when I was reading in section one the appendix to be the most useful and the most clarifying element of Spinozan philosophy. Right? Um, I find Spinoza's account as rigid and systematic and dry as it tends to be, to be absolutely fascinating and to follow completely deductively from his use of the ontological argument as laid out in those first eight definitions. Right? So, um, it, all I can do is wish you luck with this um, and point out that struggling with any of these philosophers is going to be um, eh, really rewarding if, if your struggle um, goes on unabated. Um, and uh, please email me if you have any questions. I hope this was at least a little bit useful for you. Ultimately, for Spinoza, um, human happiness in terms of his moral psychology, uh, a lot of the things that um, we would normally equate happiness with, expressing our freedom, feeling our power, that sort of thing, really power has to do with the essence of God. God is the, 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 the essentially power. Right? And us, we are so determined intellectually, morally, causally that we basically have no bloody power. Right? So ultimately for Spinoza, what it comes down to is a sort of intellectual love of God. Right? Um, that is the key to human happiness because through that intellectual love of God we actually come to understand our place within this causally and logically necessarily determined system. Right? So um, it's this intellectual love of God that is going to be the uh, key to human happiness. Interestingly, though, um, that intellectual love of God is necessarily one-sided if we consider any sort of love to have to do with any sort of preference or benevolence on the part of a God, because this God just is that it is, and is therefore, as the universe, completely indifferent to us. So when we pray or ask God for a favor or anything along those lines, what we find is that God cannot act otherwise than God, God being God. So it's, it's, it's just a conceit for us to ask for our prayers to be answered or ask for a miracle or anything along those lines. Right? So there's, I find, sort of a cheeky aspect to Spinozan philosophy um, that I find quite appealing even though it leaves us. It's it's also interesting to meet a determinist. Right? So, anyhow, um, on to Hume next. Um, hope all is well with you guys and uh, fairly well.